Let's talk about civil servants now. Um, they've been in the news. They were recently offered a lump sum of £1,500 to stop further strike action. But there's a lot going wrong there. Now, Whitehall has been accused of race, racist institutional bias. And I want to get this right, so I'm reading it. Uh, they've been accused by the civil service's largest union as it was claimed white staff were twice as likely to be promoted than their non-white colleagues. Now, before you start screaming about the race card, this came from uh, Mart Sorotka, the Public and Commercial Services Union General Secretary, who, not that it matters, is happens to be white. Because I, I, I'm just jumping ahead of all the calls who, who make it stuff. Now, in a letter, he said uh, to, he said, to, this is to Alex Chisholm, the Cabinet Office Permanent Secretary. He's talking about the data they've analysed showing a consistent pattern over the 14 months of staff recorded as white, being twice as likely to be successfully promoted as staff recorded as being non-white, with the figure for those recorded as being black even worse. The service, along with organisations such as the Metro Metropolitan Police, resist the notion it's institutionally biased. However, if the difference in promotion rates are not driven by racism, he goes on to say, please explain. Now, nearly one in 10 civil servants, 9.8% reported last year they'd face discrimination. And if you're still shouting that's because their chips on their shoulder are playing the race card, listen very carefully to this next bit. The cabinet office found that civil ser the cabinet office, the government, found that civil servants who were bullied, harassed or racially discriminated against colleagues had escaped disciplinary action. And over the course of five years, that department alone spent nearly £300,000 of your taxpayers' money settling cases of race and disability discrimination. Speaking at the House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee earlier this month, Chisholm and the Cabinet Office said they had accepted all 61 of the report's recommendations. Someone who has been there, done it, and, and gone through it, and, and will tell you what it is like to be within the civil service and, and suffer this the sorts of things that Mark uh, Soroka is talking about, uh, is my next guest, Olivia Ebags, who's an ex-civil servant, joins me now to talk about what she went through. Olivia, thank you so much uh, for your time this afternoon. I, 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 I tried in that introduction to cover all bases because I can hear, I can hear what callers are going to say, oh, it's all in your mind, it didn't happen, you're playing a race card, even the civil service admits it's doing this. What happened to you? Your story is is horrific, sadly yes. not unique. Tell us about what you went through and what job you were doing. Well, first of all, big fan. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, I joined the civil service in 2003 and ended up um, leaving in 2021 after settling out of court. And in that period, I raised three employment tribunal claims. I won one, lost one, and as I said, finally settled because of racism. I experienced blatant racism and, uh, and the most prolific type was the COVID, covert racism. So some of the things I experienced were racial stereotyping, um, name calling, references to whiteness as being the vehicle of superior skill and knowledge versus the simplicity of black people, references to black people as synonymous with marijuana, being held with, withheld from um, prominent projects because it would look like I was the token black. Oh. These are the. <laughs> Sorry, I, when you said that, it's just because I'm like, yeah. Okay, so again, hearing that other voice that doesn't want to see any other view but their own point of view, which they confuse with the absolute truth. When you say these things, uh, you know, and we often give them umbrella things, can you give me without using language you know maybe we can just go bleep break it down for me what it looked like because people say oh yeah you know you can't take a joke day in day out unless you're laughing if it's a joke unless the person you're joking about is laughing with you it ain't a joke but what sort of give me give me exactly some 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 real some examples of some what examples. was your daily life Okay, so for example, the, 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 the references to um, like white, white superiority, I was in a team meeting and uh, in describing how well um, training was received by Barbadian prison officers, my 
uh, colleagues said it was as if white women bring medicine. So that, that was a comment. And then the evening activities were interesting once you cut through the clouds of marijuana. So this is in a team meeting uh, where there are about 15 people present. I'm the only black person in the room. I'm the only black senior manager in the room. Uh, and this person is not taken to task. Uh, and I'm too vulnerable by this point because I've already made complaints of racism um, and uh, uh, they're not taken to task. Uh, and during the investigation, they were actually promoted. And when I went to court, I actually won this court case. I won this court case uh, and, uh, and I won um, claims of direct racial discrimination in court, uh, harassment, victimization. And during that period, the perpetrators were promoted. Oh, and we should say we should say as well, we're not just talking about some fiddle faddle job. We're talking about you had a really high power job training, training prison officers, training them at the highest degree. Your expertise is without, you know, Stella, uh, you you're helping the prison system. Um, and yet you are being talked to about that. And it's not just, are we talking about the odd occasion? Are we saying, oh, come on, it's just the odd occasion? Or is this, you know, when we talk about microaggressions, I, I, I kind of think we do a disservice using that word because if uh. you day in, day out, there's stuff that you have to face. What were you having to face like on a, you know, and especially once you successfully brought cases against them, I'm thinking everything was ramped up a notch. Yeah, that's what I was expecting, which is why I naive, I'm naive. I'm, I'm naive and, and eternally optimistic. So I'm thinking I've now got judicial findings of fact that I have been racially abused uh, uh, in the civil service. Uh, I, I consider myself to be in a pivotal position to help the organization improve because I'm a learning and development specialist. Uh, and uh, so you can rely not only on my learning and development skill, you can rely on my my experience, my lived experience of, of having experienced racism within the civil service and having come back to help the civil service improve. And I all all attempts I made to um, to offer to help were were shut down. I wrote my story about what I experienced to help other people in a book I entitled Almost British. Uh, and I told them about it. By this point, I had moved across to the Judicial College and I was now training judges uh, in England right. and Wales. Uh, and I was received um, positively when I told them that this is what I wanted to do. These are the reasons I wanted to do it. And within weeks of publishing the book, I was suspended from work and I was- On what grounds? On what grounds? Uh, I was uh, the the allegations were that there were several breaches of code of, of the code of conduct that I had undermined the trust of ministers uh, who expect me to be impartial uh, and uh, that I had brought the Ministry of Justice into disrepute. This is because you talked about the very things you're telling us about because you told your story. Yes. Then you're not allowed to tell your story because no. it brings them into this the fact that you experienced racism which the courts recognized under yes. their watch yes by saying to other people here's my story here's how i can help they want to shut you up and they absolutely did shut me down i so i went all the way through the appeals process i overturned the allegations now remember i'm not legally trained but this is me fighting for my life yeah. And uh, and even though I overturned the allegations, they still saddled me with a final written warning for gross misconduct and insubordination. <laughs> and then on the back of that, they they asked me not to um, reprint, market, or sell the book. So almost British was shut down for twelve years. Wow. Wow. And yet this government's for free speech. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, selective free speech. You're only allowed to say what we allowed you to say. What did this do to your mental health? Because this is something else that has come out. There's the book, Almost British. There you are. They may want to shut us down for 12 years. That won't work very well. But, you know, when, when and this is something I would remind people, speaking at the House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee earlier this month, 
the Cabinet Office has accepted all 61 of the report's recommendations. They have paid out £300,000 just on, on this thing. So really, if they don't get their house in order, more and more taxpayers' money is going to have to be spent. But what about the mental health toll of all of this? That's, that's something we shouldn't gloss over. Yeah, mentally, I was uh, systematically destroyed by the whole process because it was a daily onslaught of differential treatment um, and uh, we say microaggressions, but some of them were macro aggressions. I was being belittled in front of colleagues, um, being asked why I was in meetings when I when when I shouldn't be there when it was a part of my role. Uh, after the second court case, I was put on restricted duties. Um, I lost the second court case, uh, and I and I returned to restricted duties. Uh, and then had to face another investigation into my conduct because they were not happy that I would not apologise for writing almost British. So you that you you wouldn't apologise for writing about what you'd been through. So you yes. were being punished punished for talking about your experiences. You were meant to keep it quiet, in other words. Yes, yes. So I went to court, and the humiliation of losing wasn't enough. When I went back to work. They stripped away all of my um, line management responsibilities. They took me off the senior management team as the only black manager in the judicial college uh, and um, placed me on restricted duties whilst I had to go through this investigation process to determine my trustworthiness to continue working with members of the judiciary. Olivia, I want to thank you for, for talking about something that's very, very painful uh, and, and talking about your book so people can get further uh, information. The sad thing is that even the civil service themselves would say that this is your, uh, unfortunately, your experience isn't, you're not the only one. And no. I, and, and that's, that's very, very scary. Olivia, uh, I do want, really want to thank you for talking about what was a very painful and long drawn out experience. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us today.